So, to that, so all of that leads me here. Why are we uh-huh. standing on top of a giant landfill? What, like, why did you take me here, and why do I see so many discarded candles? Well, Dave, okay, I wanted you to see firsthand the problem facing the candle industry. Mm. L- let me hit you with this stat. This okay. is actually sit down okay. on all those discarded candles. Ow, 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 ow. Yeah, it's going to be sharp. Almost two billion candles are sold globally each year, and almost all of them are likely to end up in landfills for the next million years. Okay. I, I wouldn't say this to a lot of people, John. Yeah. You're not lying to me because you don't lie to me, John. I, I would never lie, especially about candles. I, saw, I told you that the first years, day we met. That is Gnarls Barkley crazy. <laughs> Although I must admit, this landfill does smell pretty great <laughs> compared to what I anticipated. <laughs> the, you know, the candles do kind of pick that part up, but it's disturbing. John. Hey, Dave, yeah. you're funny, but this is no time to I'm joke. So sorry, okay, the yeah. folks at Notes yep. knew that we all want our homes to smell great. I do. But figured there had to be a more responsible way. And guess what? They found the perfect solution. What did they come Let up with? Let me tell you. If you'll okay. stop interrupting me, I'll tell you. So Notes created a refillable candle system that allows you to use your candle vessel again and again. And guess what, Dave? Again. Again. Yes. Please don't interrupt me. So you don't become part of the problem. It's so easy to use. The candles are made with fragranced wax beads, and all you do is place the wick in the reusable notes jar, fill it up with the wax beads, enjoy your fragrance for up to 36 hours, and then just do it all over again when you're ready to get a new one. Oh, so that means I can switch out of fragrances all the time. That's right. That sounds great. I'm checking out their website, and I think I already have my eye on the Centol and Atlas Atlas Cedar. Cedar. I knew that would be Plumeria and Pink Current. Yep, Mm. yep, yep. The one that you're enjoying right now, uh-huh. Smell that? Mm, it's vanilla and pepperwood. Ooh. That's like my two favorite scents. Oh, no. And the names of your bunnies, right? That's right. Okay. Yeah, just coincidence there. <laughs> okay. Did you know that there are 13 amazing fragrances what? in all? Dave, that's almost 14 oh. fragrances. <laughs> handcrafted <laughs> by fragrance experts at their home base in South Carolina. And they are to die for. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Be a responsible consumer while not giving up on high-quality home fragrance by making the switch to Notes. You can build your custom starter kit right now at notecandles.com slash podcast. Right now, Notes is giving listeners 15% off and free shipping when you buy a Notes starter kit using code DADVILLE. Just use code DADVILLE when placing your order. That's code DADVILLE at notecandles.com slash podcast. Yeah. Hi, I'm Dave Barnes. And I'm John McLaughlin. And welcome to Dadville. Dadville is a podcast where we talk about life, love, and the pursuit of awesome dadding. It's funny thoughts and deep talks. So please, enjoy your time here in Dadville and enjoy this episode with... Justin Whitmell Early. You still aren't ticklish. That is crazy. I mean, I respect it, but it still blows my mind after all this time. Oh, my gosh. What time is it? Are you asleep? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's 4.30 in the morning, Dave. <laughs> How would you get in here? Well, I just I can't tell. But Oh, okay. Well, since it's morning, okay, uh, let's talk about oh. uh, rituals in okay. the morning. Okay. Because okay? yeah. taking care of your health. Oh, okay. It's, you see where I'm going. Yeah, yeah. It's not always easy, but it should be simple. Yeah. You know, and that's why for the last few years, Dave, you and I both, we've been drinking AG1. Error day. Every day. No exceptions. No. no. <laughs> you got Australian. You're so ex- it, it is, but what is it? It's, it's noon in Australia. That's, That's true. Your brain. That's true. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just one scoop mixed in water once a day, every day, or air day. Er day. Er day. And it makes us feel energized, focused, and ready to take on the day. That's right, John. And I'm not going to yell because it's morning. And that's because yeah. each serving of AG1 delivers my daily dose of vitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics, and more. It's a powerful, healthy habit that's also powerfully simple. Dave, mm-hmm. sorry to cut you off there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why do you personally trust AG1 to support your whole body health? <laughs> John, I wrote this down years ago in the hopes that you would ask me. And I'm going to read it to you. John, I know with AG1, I'm giving my body high quality nutrition every batch of ag1 goes through a rigorous testing process so you know it's safe and ag1's ingredients are sourced for absorption potency and nutrient density mm. now i have a question for you john sorry i fell what back asleep it, for a second no, yeah go excited. ahead no i was excited yeah 
Okay, what makes AG1 an essential part of your routine at this point in your life? Dave, you don't have to ask me that anymore. You know I'm just going to tell you that I started to notice that I may need a little more nutrient support than I used to. You know, I'm getting older, uh, especially when I'm on the road. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. But AG1 covers all the bases with high-quality ingredients like pre- and probiotics, yep. adaptogens, yep. antioxidants. Yep. And whole food source nutrients, Ooh, right? I yep. know if I drink it every day, I'm going to feel that extra boost. If there's one product we had to recommend to elevate your health, it's AG1. And that's why we've partnered with them for so long. So if you want to take ownership of your health, start with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase exclusively at drinkag1.com slash dadville. That's drinkag1.com slash dadville. We are here um, with our friend JWE, as we call him, Justin JWE. Wilmore Early. It's, it's safe to say we've never fought so hard to make an interview happen. Yeah, we, we, have have, right <laughs> we have really put in a shift already. Uh, I wish I could have a recording of you guys echoing and saying the same thing twice while talking about the importance of saying the same thing twice. It was it was a wild wild experience for us. <laughs> it is. It we try so to start meta. meta. Yeah. So so Justin, what we do here on Dadville is we start what we call the brag sheet. So it just kind of lets people know who you are. It's a little flex, you know. Um, and how you're superior to. <laughs> even two of us like we'll there's see. two of us and we still don't win okay so here we go graduated from uh university of virginia which is already impressive uh with a degree in english literature spent four years in shanghai china as a missionary so was that after college yeah that was after college my first uh little more almost five years after college oh wow okay cool runs his own business law practice in richmond virginia at early legal group that's a little flex this is really incredible Three books in four years, which is insanity. Uh, the Common Rule, Habits of Purpose for an Age of Distraction is go. the first, which was 19. Habits of the Household, which was is Practicing the Story of God in Everyday Family Rhythms is 21. And then last year, Made for People, Why We Drift in the Loneliness and How to Fight for a Life of Friendship is uh, was last year. Father of Four Sons, which I just want to go ahead and say... And John, I think you'll agree with me. These are the coolest four names, names. for kids yeah. I've ever heard. Right? Are you with me? Yeah. I knew you were going to think the same. I appreciate Whit, that. Wit, that. Asher, Coulter, and Shep. If they aren't either like professional underground wrestlers or like have a little like or, or Christian ground. fighting ring above ground. <laughs> you both are good. Yeah. My main goal was to get syllables for when I yeah. need to yell. With yeah, uh, chef, you know, it happened fast. You got to hit them hard. You got to well, it's dudes, dude. It's little dudes. So you got to like that's how you get their like, attention. More formal, you know, if they become lawyers, you know, Whitmore, yeah, the Asher earlier. Asher. They all sound like they're going to be like Indiana Joneses, but all of them. You know what I mean? They all have like very swashbuckling names. Uh -huh. Um. Also, this is cool. Works with you work with your dad, Mark, who's the former Attorney General of Virginia, that's and right. then uh. So, so what is fascinating for those who are listening, you probably put this together. She's a lawyer, author, and speaker, which is, you know, that's just, it's a big flex is what I'm trying to say. Stuff. Um, oh, it's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of stuff. It's things. It's about, you know, picking the right words. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that's, a, that's actually a great summation of being an author is it's just picking the right words. The right that's all words. you're doing. I got to tell you, I, John and I have been really excited about this interview. And, and as he said, we've been working hard to make it happen because... Um, these books, I mean, I, I can't think of many, we were talking about this as we were getting ready for it. We spent a week in the woods, just John and I for this one interview, just really prepping. That was mm -hmm. physically, <laughs> emotionally, spiritually, mm -hmm. uh, Man, verbally. This is um, I've never gotten this kind of red carpet treatment. It's well, it's this, it's, it's because we mean it, but what I was going to say is I can't think of many, you know, guests that are, it feels like you, what you do is like the middle of the Venn diagram for one of the reasons that we wanted to do this podcast and started however many years ago, but you write about these things that feel so unbelievably plug and play for us. So like the dilemma that we had as we were sort of thinking about talking to you is knowing it was going to be a five hour interview. It was like, how do we chop it up in, <laughs> into digestible bits? No, but just trying to figure out because all three of these books are so applicable. So it's not something where we're like, oh, okay, you know, there's, this is the one that feels like the low hanging fruit, uh, but they really are. And so what I want to do, if it's okay, is kind of spend a little time in each. Yeah. Uh, uh, so in, in starting with the common rule, here, here's kind of what 
I thought could sum this book up maybe pretty well. And you talk a lot about one of the things you say is habits form us more than we form them. Mm -hmm. uh, I love this too. The, the, here's just some flyovers of this book before I ask this question, but the modern world is a machine of a thousand invisible habits forming us into anxious, busy, and depressed people. But because our habits are the water we swim in, they're invisible to us, which I think is so true. Another quote to answer the answer to our contemporary chaos which is a band I was in in high school, metal band, is to practice a rule of life that aligns our habits to our beliefs. The common rule offers four daily and four weekly habits designed to help us create new routines and transform fra frazzled days into li lives of love for God and neighbor. So can you, this is the thing that may be sort of the easiest jump in here is can you talk us through, and if you can do this off the top of your head, I'm going to be amazed, but through the four daily and weekly habits, kind of wh what those are and, and then literally what they are? Yes. I can't. And actually, it's a perfect way to explain to the confused people out there why I'm a lawyer and a writer. <laughs> actually, <laughs> It's the because great joiner. What happened is this is a super short story. I was a missionary for a couple of years after college. Then I felt, the, I felt called by the Lord to actually go into law, which is a whole different conversation. But I really did feel it. So I think I, you're, you may be the only human that's literally ever, in any language, that's I'm the only one ever. that I've ever heard say that. <laughs> yeah. You, you and Bob Golf, possibly. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. We need to meet so we can uh, figure out if we have the same story. But so I run at law school and lawyering with all the fervor of a man on a call. And my head is in a really good place. Um, but I basically assimilated to all the typical wild patterns of law school and you know, highfalutin lawyering. And I worked my way into a horrible anxiety crash. Wow. Where I was just struggling with panic attacks, insomnia, even like bad effects from medication, even suicidal thoughts at one point mm -hmm. where I was like, my life had come, come undone. And I was like, wait, what went wrong? Cause I never, I never believed anything different. I'm not, I'm not thinking anything different, but long journey through that showed me that you know, my head was here, but my habits were off in left field and my heart had fallen. Mm. Habits. So I started taking my daily and weekly rhythms really seriously, even though this was kind of by accident at one point, it was just like, I'll try anything to get better. Mm. And I started doing some rhythms ready. Um, I was asking, I even asked my friends to keep me accountable to them. Things like scripture before phone, a daily habit of kneeling prayer three times a day, um, having a daily communal meal instead of always working on the go, a daily hour with my phone off. Those are the four daily habits I went on to write about in The Common Rule. And they actually started to radically transform my mental health, my spiritual, wow. health, the way I work, everything. And so I had this epiphany that was sort of like, oh my gosh, our habits, the things that we think are not spiritual or, or not important actually form us way mm -hmm. more than we think. And so I started to look at these regular habits of day sort of as spiritual disciplines. Um, so not just like life hacks for productivity, even though lots of them help with that too, but rather as, you know, how can we be people who are, whose head and habit are united? And mm -hmm. I can walk through the weekly habits too, but that's the short version. Well, yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear that if you don't mind what those weekly ones are. The, the, the weekly habits were fasting from something once a week. This could be food or, or like your phone or just doing a, a day that like where you actually embrace restrictions. It was one hour of, conversation with friends a week where you actually just you know this is radical for a young lawyer like actually schedule time to hang out with people instead of always canceling because you're too busy <laughs> but this was the seed actually that became my latest book made for mm, people because it's yeah. one of my most like honestly most precious weekly rhythms of just actually mm. talking to other people um sabbath mm. I made this one up, actually. So I, I thought of this new idea <laughs> called Sabbath. <laughs> it's a good one. Ten Commandments. You should somewhere. trademark that name ASAP. <laughs> uh, yeah, I need, to, I need to do that. Actually, I could make a ton of money on that. Um, <laughs> and then fourth, you know, this one was not as pithy, but it was the idea of limiting your media intake to a certain number of hours. I've actually, if I rewrote the book, I would change this habit. But it was the, it was the idea of like, look at your week and be like, how much time do you want to spend on social media and Netflix. Not that it's bad, but mm -hmm. just pick a couple hours here, a couple hours there, and then call it and turn your devices off. It worked for me, it hasn't worked for many other people, but it, the, the impulse is to start to think about like whether you're in charge of your media time or the people on the other side of the screen are. Those are the four weekly habits. Um, Friendship one is actually my favorite. That's why I became the latest book. It's interesting that you, I, I feel like with 
with habits. I think that the the lie that we believe, or I, I'll just speak for myself. It's like I have such a bad grip on how much time I actually spend on things. You know yes. what I mean? It's almost like we have our conscious That's right. narrative self or whatever, what we tell ourselves. Like, I don't think, I, you know, I probably spend like whatever, 30 right. minutes a day on my phone or whatever. Or, you know, I spend X amount of time doing all these things. That's what we tell ourselves. And so when we want to make some kind of a change, we're like, well, I don't really have time to throw in X because I'm, you know, everything's all scheduled out, but we're so bad. Again, I should bring it back to me. I'm so bad at actually having a realistic grip on how much time I spend on things. And right. I think your book is so great because it, it breaks things down so that you start to realize like, oh, these things that are tangible and really simple and just like three kneeling prayers a day, you know, like, it doesn't take that much no, time, just one hour without your phone. You know, like it's it's really, really helpful, I think. It makes me curious, though, like what you say that the Friends is your your favorite thing. What is what's the one that was hardest for you or is hardest for you? Yeah, um, the fasting is hardest for me now, honestly. Mm-hmm. But what you, what you were saying um, is so typical. It's actually we're actually there's great studies on this. We chronically overestimate the time that we're doing productive things that we want to do and underestimate the time like that you ask people how much they watch tv and just compare the stats or how much they sleep and compare the stats uh, we, we sleep more than we say we do actually like something about our mm. culture we underestimate our sleep like oh i only sleep like six hours a day when it's actually seven and a half or something mm, right um, right we're actually healthy like we should be getting that yeah much. yeah but i just like what you say because when people ask me like wait list out all these habits i'm almost hesitant because you get any, you, a typical listener will get overwhelmed of like, oh, wait, 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 okay, that's cool for that guy, but I can't, there's no way I can do all that stuff. But what I tell people is one, anyone who lists out all their habits, um, and most of us don't pay enough attention to even know what they are, but if you did, all of us would be like, oh my gosh, that's over. I don't even think about like, you know, you do this in the morning. Right. But what's, what I say about these, um, and you can take the hour of phone with your phone off as an example. All of these are small, what they call psychologists call keystone habits, where they're small, almost tiny incremental changes that have macro effects. Hmm. And the burden is not adopting new small habits like these. Like these are actually pretty easy to start. The burden, I think, is doing nothing. Like if you hmm. yeah. because if you do nothing, you live in the typical American current of wild stress and busyness and distraction. And that is incredibly, it's an incredibly heavy burden. Hmm. But to do a couple things differently to fight back, yeah, I'm not gonna say it's easy, it's hard, but it's a lot lighter of a burden actually than just to live in the normal life. So I'm much happier, you know, turning my phone off an hour a day. Hey, Dave. Hey, Johnny. Okay. Um, just a quick question. How long are you going to keep me out here in the desert? <clears throat> like I'm starting to run out of sunscreen. I could, I could go for a feast on some bread mm-hmm. alone, you know? Sorry, I was just drinking more of my gallons of water I brought with me. <sighs> We're going to be here 40 days, John, so just buckle up. Get comfortable, my man. Man, that seems like a long time. Mm-hmm. Who's that guy over there who keeps tempting me? Do you know him? Uh, yeah, that's Gary. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't pay attention to Gary. Wait a minute. Wait. Is this another object lesson from your teen study Bible? <laughs> you betcha, John. And since <sighs> we're in the middle of Lent, I figure it's appropriate. This adventure from Matthew chapter 4 is just one of the many amazing stories of the teen study Bible. Now available in updated editions, John. Okay. It's got the NIV. It's got the King James, the New King James, the NKJ as I call it. It has sold over 4 million copies. Ooh. You know, the teen study Bible is great. Because it helps teens discover how God's truth relates to their life today and helps them apply God's word to issues that they face, like bullying, depression, peer pressure, and stress. You'll also find notes, articles, book intros, character profiles, Q&As, and more, offering the knowledge, strength, and clarity to navigate life's challenges with Scripture as your guide. Find out more about the Teen Study Bible and order your copy today at Amazon.com slash Teen Study Bible. 
<laughs> Tag you it. <laughs> okay. Hey, Dave. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Sorry to stop. Can, can we take a break? I got to get some coffee. Oh, yeah. Did you say coffee? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, today's episode in my morning cup of joe is brought to you by, let's sing it together. Here we go. Three, two, one. Methodical coffee. Methodical coffee. I'm a little we juiced on it right now. Two, <laughs> yeah, different directions. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. Dave, methodical coffee. Let me tell you something about Please, it. They, <laughs> they have craft coffee and tea mm. for people of all kinds. Roasted, blended, brewed, served, and perfected by verified coffee and tea nerds like myself. I thought you were going with an Italian accent there for a second, John. That was exciting. That's exactly right, the John. <laughs> and now Methodical has resolved the headache of having too little or too much coffee from your traditional time-based coffee subscription. With Methodical, you can subscribe by usage. <laughs> Receive a free smart scale that tracks your coffee consumption and triggers your next order right at the perfect time. Amazing. So you always have just the right amount of coffee on hand, worry-free. You know, and the best part is you can receive 20% off your first bag and 10% off all subsequent bags with no code needed when you try the free smart scale. John, we also have our very own dad filled. That's right. It's the fuel that gets me going every Mm -hmm. morning, filled with hints of chocolate, graham, and brown Brown sugar. sugar. That's right. Because Methodical, they're on a mission to connect people to the beauty of life through coffee experiences for people like you. Methodical's been roasting and hosting for over nine years. That's almost ten years. And they offer a wide selection of coffees and teas from dark and roasty to bright and funky. Like you, Dave. Bright and funky. On their site, you'll also find a brew guide that teaches you how to turn your coffee brewing chore into a beloved ritual. Craft a cup you'll love with Methodical Coffee. Also, get 10% off your first order of coffee or tea with the discount code DADFILL. That's my coffee there. Methodical. Well, you know, the thing that I think is so cool uh, about what you're saying is is really two things. But I heard this great. I was just the Bible Project and Tim Mackey was talking about this study that like there's no such thing as just being like life isn't a isn't a, um, a like a lake. You're not just sitting there and there's no current. And yeah, hey, today I wouldn't control. That's right. Yeah. You know, it's this yeah. it's this really powerful river. And so if you're if you jump in and it may not look like you've moved much but you get out you know 2 minutes later and you're 2 miles down from where you got in and That's his right. point is like so he was making more of the point of like as a christian you're you're we just have to keep swimming against stream or otherwise it takes us but i think it's true in what you're saying too habitually because you know it's like i i could have great intentions for now but you know 6 months from now I'll sort of look up especially you know when when life gets busy and add kids and all that stuff to it you know, you sort of look up and you're like, man, I mean, time is just flying. And if there's not some sense of intent, this river only goes at one speed all the time. Yeah. So I can't. So I think one, it's helpful in knowing that, that, you know, there is this sense of this stuff is going to happen. It's, habits are going to happen either way. That's what, that's one of the mm-hmm. things I love about this book is it, it's not saying like you should develop habits. Like, no, you've got habits. You've you got, got, yeah, you've you're, got, you're swimming in somebody's river. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's right. Where is it going? You know? Yeah. Well, and but the best think, example, I think for somebody who's maybe coming at this for the first time is open your phone and go to screen time. That's yeah. the best thing that Apple has done. They've put they've put these Everything things in our pockets. Right. Now that we can actually see, like, oh my goodness, I had no idea how much time I was spending on my phone. And you right, can go yeah. through and like see the apps. Like, if you if you see that and you're like, well, I'm doing emails and for nonprofit work all the time. It's like, well, <laughs> hang on, let's look at Instagram. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got an hour free every day for Instagram, and that's me watching uh, videos of nonprofits, nonprofits that are very informative <laughs> to my workflow. But I love the thing. Those it's not you know at first it seems restrictive all the things you're you know supposed to you know, not do but for me and especially i think this helps with creatives too when you start to think and habit it's almost like you have a superpower for all the things that you wanted to do but you never and wished you did but you never do do so like as a writer for example um i practice a morning writing hour where i just when i get to work it's 8 a.m to 9 a.m before i start my legal work and that discipline is a total joy because mm. it's the hour I'm allowed to just read whatever I want or doodle or noodle on whatever I want or write something. And yeah, when it's a book draft is due, it becomes the hour that I'm cranking. But that's how, like you can write books while having your actual job be lawyering 
simply because of habit. Like I'm nothing, I'm not special in any way. Mm. And I think for, for creators, I'm curious about you guys as musicians, like the, the discipline of saying, um, I show up at the same time every day, hoping that the muse will show up too, <laughs> but I'll yeah. be there. You know, I, I feel like it's actually, it's super important for anybody's life, but it's not just for us. Like, you know, I'm not really a type A lawyer, but I think sometimes people think, oh, this is because he's a type A lawyer. Like, no, yeah, I was opposite. That's why I needed this stuff, actually. Well, there, there's a funny quote in Nashville that people, I love this quote, but people say it takes you as long as you have to write a song, you <laughs> yeah. know? And yeah. so I think I, I notice the days I do the best work are when I actually have three hours from, you know, noon to three or what, you know, two hours from 10 mm -hmm. to 12. And it's like, I will actually get so much more done because there is some sense of like, it's a finite amount of time. When I have a whole day, it's a nightmare unless I've already got a lead and you know, you're, you're going and you're following what was right. already there yesterday. I totally agree with that. It's so hard. You know, it's funny that you said that you, when you were talking about your writing hour, Mm -hmm. and how much of a joy it is for you, which I love that it is a joy for you. That's great. I want that to be a joy for you. But there's, I have some morning routine things that I do that long-term, big picture, I love them. And I love that I do them. And every single morning, I don't want to do them. <laughs> well, tell me more about, I, I totally resonate, by the way, but I'm curious, like, what are they? Pretty much everything I do, I do in the morning. Like, base, I want to wake up, and I want to reach for my phone and I want to open my phone and I want to, it, there's not even anything in particular. I want to see who's, who's texted me how many, you know, funny videos has Dave posted on Instagram. I want to watch those <laughs> videos. You know, I just want to, I just want to basically wake up and then my mind immediately wants to be entertained. And it's so hard for me to, to wake up in the morning and I, I go to the, our front room but I, ideally, I do this before everybody's up and I have like a little, you know, quiet time. Like I do some stretches that I don't want to do every single day. I don't want to do them. I do a little meditation that I really don't want to do every day. And then I do some reading and then I'll reach for my phone. But uh, it's I think it's I think it's interesting how like when we talk about habits and anytime you know, I want to be clear, like that I have mornings that I don't do any of that. And I grab my phone and, and that's my morning. And I always feel worse those mornings. Right, but it, right, right. You can have good habits that you, st that you don't like to do. You know, you can still do things. You don't, I think sometimes people think people, somebody like you who has all these great habits and good for you because you love to do them. I don't like to do them. And I think, right. Right. It's okay to have good habits that you like to, or that you, that are good for you, that you never end up liking. Well, you know, you, you know what I think is so yeah. powerful too, is that when, when you sort of have these habits that you do, it, it, it's like, it gives you this, and it's not, control is a tricky word, but it does give you this sense of, of control, of intentionality that you have agency over your day that's and your right. life. Is, the, is a great way to put it, yeah. And you're not, I think that's what I struggle with on days where I lay down in bed and I'm like, God, that was just, that didn't go how I wanted. Most of the time, not all the time, because life can interfere in wild and crazy ways sometimes, but most of those days are because I just didn't apply myself. I didn't go like, hey, that's the thing I should do today, or I had this great idea for this thing, I shouldn't do it. You know, and so I think what's so great about these habits and what John's saying with his morning routines, and like this morning got up and ran, and I'm like, you know, I'm getting to bed last, I'm laying out stuff to because I get up, you know, usually around on six, six fifteen for about four hours. And uh and I was like, <laughs> you know, as I'm laying out the outfit, I'm like, I don't want to do it's freezing. Like this is gonna be miserable, you know. But the minute I'm done and I'm sitting on my porch, cooling off, I'm like, God, I'm so glad because oh, yeah. already the day feels different. Oh, I'm yeah. like, this is my day. It's not. I mean, it's not my day, but it feels that way. It's kind of like, you know. You bet. I I, I love what you're both saying, and, and John, I I completely agree. There's there's some things that I find a joy that like oh, I get because so many people are clamoring for my time and my writing hours like a joy. Like I get to do this. However, when a manuscript's due. And I feel literally, I think the spiritual warfare of, I don't want to do this. I'm no good. I don't have anything to say. I'm a total fraud. Why am I even writing in the first place? And right, yeah. there are times where that becomes, it's, it's a fight. But because I'm in the rhythm, 
it's easier just to be like, well, this is the decision that I make. There's like, there's no real debate here. It's like, I'm going to do this. And that's with a lot of habits that you know, my scripture before phone habit. I mean, yeah, t- totally often. I'm like, I wonder what people are saying on the text chain this morning, but I'm just like, you know, my, it's my rhythm, but, but it's not a rule. And I think that's really important. Rhythms are not rules wow. ha- and habits have exceptions. Mm-hmm. And that is super important. Like there are p- days where this gets off. Mm-hmm. And uh, for me, I don't feel, I feel much less guilty about it. Cause I'm just like, Oh, I, I need to get back to the habit Yeah. Um, rather than, you know, Oh, I broke my rule. Like, no, it's rhythms are not rules. And I think that's really helpful. That's a yeah. Great I think it's good to to acknowledge that it can it can be unhealthy to be too like shame can come in. You yeah, miss a yeah. day, right? And then right. you know that voice in your head is like, "Well, yeah, you missed a day because you're not worth anything." You know, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, so I mean, th- this is the trick of this interview. Because we got to keep there's like there's two other books um, we have to talk about because it's but there's so much to mine in each of these. So, so the second one, Habits of the Household. Um, which feels like, and I mean, oh, it's deeply uh, related. Like, it's, yeah, it's 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 great. It feels like a continuation, and I think, like you know, I love the way that it says that um, walk through everyday ordinary moments from waking to mealtime, bedtime moments of discipline and screen time, and asks how these small moments of our routines can become powerful acts of spiritual formation. I think what's really beautiful about this idea that's taking the habits, but then you're going everything is kind of its own habit and can be redeemed or redemptive in these ways that. You may not even suspect it to be, which is a really beautiful, and especially as a parent, it's such a challenging thought because right. you kind of go like, oh man, even be- I love, I-, I watched on your Instagram feed about, you know, uh, uh, the bedtime routine you have and how it's so, and it's so cute and sweet. But I mean, even those little moments, yeah. again, it's this idea, it's intentionality. There's nothing that I probably struggle with more and I shame myself more in my life than the idea of the lack of intentionality. Oh. It bothers me so much like that I'm going to wake up someday and be like, if you had only just taken hold, but it's, it's, the, it's what this book to me is so compelling. That's the part of the book. So compelling to me is how do you sort of inject not just um, intentionality, but in the smallest things that may not feel like they can be that way. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I, I wanted to talk about was, uh, this idea that we become our habits and our kids become us, which is terrifying. terrifying. Um, this is why habits of the household are the most spiritually formative things that parents can do. Can you kind of talk us through that yeah, idea? Yeah. So, I mean, so I actually think of these as concentric circles. Um, mm. Maybe just because I want to say my book so far are a trilogy, <laughs> but, but like they're really <laughs> so Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, you know, I, I hit a real low in my life right and and these treating habits as spiritual disciplines was the way that the lord like really pulled me out of a a place of real darkness Mm. so i think i approach them not as things that i have to do but i get to do because i know how dangerous i am to myself right Yeah. yeah but i came to a place where after like two three years where i was like my technology habits were like really ordered my work habits were really ordered but I was regularly yelling my kids to bed in the evening. <laughs> I was. <laughs> Isn't that such a great way to end the day? Yeah, it's I know. It's so good. Good for everybody. It's that you know agency and intentionality. Is like I'm just going to yell them to bed because that's the kind of guy. I'm I tired. Love- I'm out of ideas. I just love the phrase "yell them to bed." And it works. It's just a, it's just a fun <laughs> phrase. As it turns out, you know, threats of bodily violence. No, it actually it didn't work. That was the problem. So I'm usually gonna, that's I, them threatening me with bodily violence. Yeah, yeah. No, it both ways. Yeah, they don't threaten. They just punch me in the stomach. This is how like <laughs> they're greeting my my five year old shepherd. He just man, I'm getting my abs are getting stronger from it. But so oh, now yeah. I, I had this experience one night of just. You know, the bath water on the floor, like the boys are doing their naked wrestling matches because they've escaped from bath. I'm, so I've got four boys. Yeah, um, It's as wild as you think it is. And I did the yell them to bed thing where I just lost my temper. And, and I was reflecting as I closed their door one night because I was like, gave them a short prayer. God, God loves you. And I do, too. I shut the door and I was like, what do they think love means? Because I just popped off. and. Dave and John, here's the important part. It was normal. Like this is what, so my realization was, oh, my habits in the household are these rhythms of anger and shouting Mm. and, um, and their misbehavior causes my misbehavior. So it was, I would say it was a gracious realization in that Mm. 
It was like, hey, you can be doing great at this part of your life and totally you know, <laughs> stop it fumbling on the other. But the Lord showing me that was, mm. was, was, yes, very humbling that like I'm an author writing about healthy habits and I'm yelling my kids to bed every night. But on the other hand, it was a huge moment where I was like, I want to apply what he's teaching me here over here. Mm. And thus that was habits of the household. I started to think about starting with that bedtime routine, mm. but then into morning routines and meal times and moments of discipline. So much of with when, when you're with kids, so much of that stuff is happening off the cuff, which means it's a result of your instinct. Yeah. And mm. I, I like to tell people, you can't think your way out of a problem. You didn't think your way into like you practice your way into this. So you need to practice your way out. So that way you oh, that's good. It's or like, you know, that face you make at your wife or your, um, th- these are instincts and yeah, we don't like them, but that part of our brain that doesn't like them wants to change them. It's not the same part that's turning along and, and habit, which is why the neuroscience of habit is so helpful because you have to practice and activate that part of the brain to correct these rhythms. So uh, thinking about like practicing different rhythms of discipline is a way to change your heart of discipline, this is, which is why I say all the time, like habits lead the heart. So pay attention to them. Mm. Um, and so the habits of the household is all about this with children. So what, what are those, what are some of the ones that you find yourself doing with your kids? Like how is that iterated into your life? Like, yeah. So two great examples are one, one, we mentioned the bedtime routines or liturgies. One of the things that I started during that season of realizing, Oh my gosh, I'm, this is horrible. Is I started doing a nightly prayer with them. It was a super short prayer. It was a series of yes or no questions. Um, it's kind of more of a bedtime liturgy than a prayer. I'd say, can you see my eyes? You say, yes. And I say, can you see that I see your eyes? Yes. Do you know that I love you? Yes. Do you know I love you no matter what bad things you do? Yes. Do you know I love you no matter what good things you do? Yes. Who else loves you like that? God does. And then I'll just be like, you know, rest in that love. And, and okay, on the sentimental side, that's a neat exchange that, there, and there's a lot there to unpack. But on the practical side, you know, the first time I did it with them, I'm like, can you see my eyes? They're like, yeah, right. You know, poke me in the eyes or do, do you know that I love you no matter what bad things you do? You know, they're like, like this. No, I don't think so. Like you don't because you react this way when we do. So it was, you know, the important thing for any parent listening is, you know, nothing is normal until it is. Yeah. But the household is the place where you can make the weirdest things normal for better or worse. Yeah, so yeah. in practicing this sort of call and response exchange of God loves us unconditionally, no matter how our behavior went today, was actually an incredibly powerful thing to change me. So mm-hmm. the, the, the place where I knew it was working was where we had a very similar evening with all the same misbehaviors on their part. But I knew that I was marching towards this bedtime liturgy. So I started to act different because I had, I had interrupted my typical routine. Um, and, and again, that's the fighting habit with habit <clears throat> where the circumstances were all the same, but my reaction to them were different. And that's when I realized, oh my goodness, you know, the Lord wants to use, um, our, the, he wants to use these habits as ways to interrupt our otherwise broken nature and say, there are different options available to you here. I want to work with you here. And that really has really helped the way I approach bedtime. Um, wow. And then it's such other- a great idea to have, to literally start with the, like sort of the tactileness of it to say yeah. like, can you see my eyes? Well, like for one to have it be yeah, sort of interactive. Like the boys to be like, Hey, I'm here. We're yeah. Not. Yeah. Well, it like it's, it grounds, it grounds you a little bit. It grounds both of you. Mm-hmm. Like it's something to actually hold on to in the room in real time yeah. and yeah. they're a part of it. It's not just like, okay, dad's going to talk to me and I don't know how long it's going to go. You know, I've been doing that all day with them. You know, That's right. It's and, so- and I call it, you know, bedtime liturgy because a big t- theme in my writings that in the common rule habits as well is just to see habits as liturgies. Mm-hmm. That is that they're, things that are going on over and over, semi-conscious to unconscious, they're forming us who we are. The difference is lit- liturgy admits that it's an act of worship. Um, mm. Habits obscure what we worship, but that doesn't mean we're not worshiping. So it's a way to sort of, it's a, a language way to open our eyes to, hey, these mundane habits that you think are just habits are actually incredibly 
spiritual acts mm-hmm. one way or the other, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, and if you think about it, liturgies are often tactile and physio- physiological. That's why we do them. Mm-hmm. So, and I say, you know, you know obviously God's not going to listen to you more just because you kneel. But kneeling is a way to get, like, use the body to get the attention of the heart mm. or the soul. And, and some of these bedtime liturgies with the kids are the ways to use the body to get my patience, like to access my patience or to access, mm. the, you know, their, their heart is, you know, touching or eye contact and these things. And, of course, this is like, 90 percent of parenting right it, when you start to think oh physiologically we're affecting each other how do i touch them interact with them look at them volume tone all these things another another big one for me um is pause prayers which is an idea like in a moment of discipline before i go to you know before i react i practice this habit of a pause prayer which is super short by the way because like I'm hearing a fight break out over the Nintendo Switch controllers upstairs, right? And I'm hearing, no, he's going to hit me. So I'm like, I got to (laughs) move. I don't have a lot of time. But Anne Lamott once wrote that the most powerful three prayers are help, thanks, and wow. So Mm. I'm talking about that level of length. But that idea of before I run up and be like, whoever hit him, I'm going to hit, you know? (laughs) Or, or, Or just like totally losing it is just like on my run up the stairs to be like, Lord, help. Hmm. which is, you know, a longer way of saying, help me be more like you in this moment. Hmm. Because I'm, a per- I'm not like a kind of person who also doesn't like it when other people take my stuff, right? Yeah. I also don't like it when people hit me, as it turns out. Um, and I'm prone to snap back. And I'm just thinking, you know, Lord, help me have the grace and the truth that you show up with me for. Like, you don't, you're too truthful to leave me in my misbehavior, but you're too gracious to shame me out of it or, or um, force me out of it with anger. And so I just find that quick prayer, that acknowledgement that mm. I'm not alone in this interaction and I want Jesus's help changes the way I do react, which is the whole goal. Because every, mm. any parent can get to the end of the interaction and be like, I wish I did not X. But to have that habit of saying, help, Lord, so that I don't X, you know, is it's just been incredibly helpful in my discipline. Because I'm prone to, as I've mentioned now a couple of times, like totally lose my temper. Dave. That's good. Hey, pop quiz, Dave. Sorry to come in so aggressive there, but I get okay. so aggressive with pop quizzes. Okay. <laughs> what comes best in bundles? Um, uh, beans or apples? That's a bushel, oh. not a bundle. Oh, okay. Uh, bananas? Uh, still a bushel? Corn. I'm not. I'm, I'm not okay. <laughs> Just so, listen to this. Right. Whoa. What about selling on Shopify with the Shopify Bundles app, where you can create and sell product bundles with ease? Of course, of course, John. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business, from the launch your online shop stage to the first real life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million dollars stage that happened for me so long ago I can barely even remember it. <laughs> but Shopify is there to help you grow. Uh, whether you're selling scented rocks or scented socks, John. People, it's crazy out there in the streets. Or vending violet velvet. See what I did there? I do. Shopify helps you sell everywhere. From their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system, whatever and wherever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout. 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms. That's insane. And sell more with less Less effort thanks to the Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. And Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way because businesses that grow grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash dadville, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash dadville now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash dadville. Having enough, that, that's so convicting because I think it, it the reactive part of parenting is so 
And, and, and you know what, really, uh, this is another thing that I, I really grieve about myself that I, I want to do better with is like, and I think that as John and you were both talking about that idea of like, look at me, I'm looking at you, you know, do you see my eyes and vice versa is, and John, and I've talked about this on, the, on this podcast before, but like, you know, sometimes a win for me is just that every day I had a moment where my kid and I were really with each other. Yes. You know, and if that, like, you know, yesterday I was so cognizant in church of my daughter was sat with me for a second and kind of snuggled up. And then my son during one of the, you know, we're singing had his, he was standing on the pew behind me and he has arms around me, but just for moments, like, you know, if I have a day where I really feel like was a good day with my kids, it usually is as simple as we just had each of us with the three of them, I had with each of them, I had one moment where we were squared up. Because, and, and I agree that I'm not better at sort of, you know, if there's a thought I have, I mean, John and I laugh about this a lot because I think we both struggle with, but if there's a, if, as we lay down, um, not together, uh, but in our, you know, parent, and it's like laying there as dads reflecting on the day. One of the things that I, I just grieve is that I'm like, I just been my oldest. I saw him all day and I never really had like a moment with him, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. that, that he was, you know, 10 feet away from me after school, before school. And I just never really looked at him and had any kind of interaction that was really heartfelt or like grounded, Yeah, you know, and those days and they just fly. And so I think for me, that's so, I love what you're saying with this idea of this liturgy of yeah. connectivity, because it's just so important. I, I mean, two reasons I love that one, just because over and over studies show and common sense does too, that just showing up and being present is one of the the greatest gifts you will ever give your children. And Mm -hmm. so one of the things I talk about a lot with parents about that hour with the phone off that I mentioned earlier, I talk about this in Habits of the Household too, because for a parent to say, I'm going to discipline my technology so that I can order my day with the kids instead of letting, you know, Facebook alerts order my day with the the children. And just to say, I want to be present, like whether it's just eye contact or the gift, I think about this a lot of saying, I'm not going to parent my sons out of my inbox emotions. Like it's Mm -hmm. totally unfair when I'm mean and mad at them because I just received a stressful email. They have no idea what's going on. They have no idea why dad is different right now. They have no, you know, and which is a realization that I had to come to years in Mm -hmm. where, which I think is true for all of us as parents is that whatever, whenever I fly off the handle with my girls, it 10 times out of 10, it's probably not because of what they just did. Mm-hmm. It's yes. because if you backtrack, you know, throughout my day, it's it's an email that I got. Right. Yeah. So like actually being present enough to respond to them, not respond to the world through your actions to them. Right. And so that that, that idea of being, just being present is such. I tell you what was terrifying to me, and, and I, it, this is so embarrassing. Last night is one of the first nights where I really try to do this, and everybody that's judging me, God knows that, and He knows your heart, and He's therefore judging you, maybe right now too. But um, I think you know, sitting down, like, and I noticed this with my son, my youngest, who's seven. It, it, we were watching something, just watching. It's on TV, like we're watching a soccer game or something, whatever, and. I was on my phone just because I'm in this terrible habit of doing both things at one. Like if it's sort of a casual watching, I'm a, suddenly I'm like scrolling through Twitter. If it, and I'm like, and I just remember being like, dad, dad, are you watching? And I was like, yeah. But I mean, I'm, and I was like, isn't it funny mm. that he, that we're just, it's not even like his show, you know, it's just a show, but yeah. he's like, you're not even doing that with me. And I think well, it's your eyes to be where his eyes are. His eyes are. That's yeah, exactly yeah. right. Yeah. And so last night, you know, we were watching the, the NFL games playoffs and I, and I, I was, a proud of myself I was like, I'm going to leave my phone over there. Cause even though we're just watching these games, I want them to know that I'm here watching. But I was like, isn't it funny that even, even that, even that he's like, you know, that I would think, Oh, this is kind of good out of jail free. I mean, we're just, he doesn't care. And he's like, no, you're not being here. That's even right. though we're not doing this. We're not thing. doing the same thing. Have you guys heard of the RO box? Yes. Huh. I, I, okay, John is shaking his head no, but I I love these guys. They're great guys, and um, but it's it's a nice looking box that you put in your foyer, your living room, maybe your kitchen, and it is a prompt, a nudge, like physically in your house because it's where your phone goes. It's a chart. It, ch- it both charges your phone, oh, okay. it syncs with the the RO app, which records your time off, and you can share it with other people to sort of gamify like how often am I off, you know? But but just Dave, what you were saying, it's. For me, 
it's the helpful because it's like, oh, this is where your phone goes when you're at home. Um, so that you're just the default is presence. And that's what I think yeah. the big, a big swap mm. is. It's like, it's totally fine for me to go over to the RO box, take my phone out and shoot an email, but I tend to stand there and then put it back in. Or my kids know, like, hey, you know, sometimes they even ask, hey, put your phone in the RO box so we can play this game or something, you know. And uh, it's a, mm. also a great way to teach your kids. So, yeah, go to anybody can go check it out. But D- Dave, that's I was going to. a great say, idea. Yeah. It, I mean, it's great. It's totally worth the, the, expense um i mean think about how much you spend on your phone and think about how much you'd be willing to spend to go off your phone that's you know that's what but i just want to mention what the one more thing i love about that moment of presence thing dave is that um i always try to remind people you know it is a given in a house that we're going to hurt each other and make a lot Mm -hmm. of mistakes because Mm -hmm. it centers living with sinners I mean, mm-hmm. this is marriage, these are your friendships, these are your children, these are your parents. Yeah. It's totally unsurprising that we're going to make mistakes and hurt each other. So that's the mark of a Christian household is not that you don't hurt each other. Right. The mark of a Christian household is that you repair and repent yeah, and yeah. reconcile. And those, you can't do that outside of presence. Mm. So those ideas that, oh, I, I shared a moment with them today is so powerful because all, often that's the moment when you're repairing because we didn't do good mm. this morning we had a moment this afternoon and, and looking for those like presence is where you repair. Um, mm. And that's, I just think a, an enormous difference. Cause you can, you can grow cold in, in, you know, in all the sins we commit. We just be silent about it mm. or we can be reconciliatory. We can actually reconcile, which is the story of the Bible, which is why the subtitle mm. of this book, you know, the story practicing the story of God in everyday family rhythms. It's this idea of saying this, we're living in a story of reconciliation. Why don't we make that a habit with our kids? Mm. Mm-hmm. God, that's beautiful. That's good. You should write about that. The, um, okay, and then this 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 book. I mean, I, again, it's such a great tri- trilogy. Your point. It's a tri- uh, yeah, I'm glad. Right, we're gonna get this documented. Here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, and I would I would say made for people is the Return of the Jedi. It really brings the whole thing home. Um, I, and, and, and so the sort of quick overview of this one, this is a great quote. Loneliness has become a cultural epidemic affecting the health and happiness of millions. Busyness, fear of vulnerability, and past pain often stop us from developing deep friendships we long for. But it's not supposed to be this way. We are made for people. And I'm telling you, this one I, I feel is strongly, maybe even more strongly um, than I do the other two. Because as, a, as someone, you know, and John's the same way, who had so many friends and has so many friends, you know, um, and then li- family life is just this crazy thing to navigate. And I mean, if, if you know, imagine, I imagine Justin, like if you'd have told your 22 year old self, like you're going to be at a time of your life where discipline is that you have an hour a week with your friends. You'd have been like, whoever that guy is. I'm not like, signing up for that. No, I'm, not, I'm not signing up for it. But when you say that in my soul, I go, God, ow, that would be amazing. And I'm like, and this is, and you know, some of that is totally okay. It's like, this is yes. what family and it's, it's what your time is required of you to do these things and mm-hmm. basketball games and soccer games and ballet and all the things. Um, but it, that is where we've gone to. And one of the things that um, – and I've said this a lot on this podcast, but I think I've learned as much as anything in the last five years of my life is just this idea that God – and it sounds so ridiculous, people who know this – better than I do, but God really did make us like, make us, make us to be together. Like he made us to be together. Yes. Right. Like we really are physiologically made to be with each other. And I think that doesn't mean we don't have time by ourselves. It doesn't mean for the introverts that they're like, uh, something's wrong with me. That's not, that's not it, but we are made to be interconnected. Right. Yep. Yep. And I think uh, when you look at the body of the Christ, that uh, the body of the church and, and who Christ may be, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's all there. It's, it's, it's well-documented um, throughout scripture, but I just don't think we believe that. And I think we justify things as more important. I mean, one of the things you said that I think is so interesting, uh, like becoming busier, wealthier people, you know, is mm-hmm. such a, I love that point you made. I, I think I saw you say that maybe on, a, on another podcast, but can you kind of speak to that? Like what the impetus of this yeah. book was and why it is that we're sort of trying to be busier, wealthier people? I love that you brought up the Lake River metaphor earlier mm-hmm. um, because the subtitle of this book is, uh, why we drift hmm. in loneliness and how to fight for a life of friendship. Hmm. Because, you know, I'm, I was one just thinking, seeing in my personal life how the current of American life is to become busier, wealthier people yeah. who used mm-hmm. to have friends. Mm. And that 
is, I think, shocking to most people um, when they wake up in their later 20s or early 30s. I mean, there's, there's been a great meme floating around the past year that's like, nobody ever talks about Jesus' greatest miracle, that he had 12 friends, 12 yeah. friends. <laughs> it's, yeah, you know, yeah. it's like, it's, it's helpful because, um, no, you, like the way you put it, Dave, yeah, no, I would not have said that I'm going to look up in my 30s and be like, if I can do an hour of friends a week, then, you know, that's great. Um, but that's the current. Now, some of that is fine because, yeah, some of that is you, you've become a, a dad now and you and you you need to provide for a family now. And as it turns out, parenting kids and working takes a lot of time, you know. Yeah. But we no longer live in the kinds of like architectural communities, like literally in like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. geographic or proximity that would allow us to incorporate community into those phases of life. So remote work. Um, driveways, you know, cars instead of buses, back porches instead of front porches. You can literally look at the architecture of our life, mm -hmm. from our technology to our asphalt, to our homes mm -hmm. and say, oh, we're now in a type of culture mm -hmm. that is extremely conducive to isolation and individualism. Yeah. Not to mention that then, you know, worldview speaking or sort of like the ph philosophical current is, is also uh, this idea that you know, fundamentally you're an individual and some of this sneaks mm. into Christianity. Like, Oh yeah. So that fundamentally at the end of the day, you know, it's you and your walk with Jesus. Mm. And some of that was like, I think people are trying to be helpful. Like, you know, you're yeah, yeah, yeah. Your Jesus where it's at. It's just not how the Bible talks about it. Mm. It's, it's just not, it's the, you look at Genesis and you see God with Adam saying to Adam, to his face, it's not good for you to be alone. So yeah. thing for God to say, when God is there, right? Mm. And you're like, wait, you can be lonely with God? Mm. That's a theological insight that you, you can't mm. experience him the way you were made to and you, until you experience him alongside others. And as it turns out, you can't do marriage the way you're made to until you do marriage amidst the community. You can't do parenting the way that you're made to until you do parenting in community. You, can't, you, you just name it. You can't work. You can't have mental health. You can't have physical health. Everything about us is meant to thrive with other people. And so it's a similar, like that outer concentric circle of just saying, if that's true, what kind of habits are we going to have to fight against the current? Because yeah. nobody is shepherding you into friendship in modern day America. Mm. It's the exact opposite. You've right, got to swim, right. like you, you got to swim upstream. Like you got to fight for your life. Mm. How are you going to do it? You know? Yeah. You well, know? you know, uh, the, 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 this is, I mean, I don't want to botch this because if I botch it, it's like the most heretical thing ever. But I remember this really amazing thought, and I can't remember who said it. But when God says it's not good for, for you to be alone, and I got to tiptoeing this very carefully, but like it sort of, um, you can understand when he says that, that me being with you is not like there needs to be more than just me and you. Mm -hmm. And, and I, you know, you got to be careful with that because God is all we need. But, yeah. but him saying that, says something else too, though, that like, you know, that, that you need other people to be with. And mm -hmm. I think that again, in Christendom, it gets tricky because it's like, oh, you need is the Lord. And he, right. and it's like, yes, comma, but, you know, why would he have ever said that if that wasn't true? And so I think, yeah. you know, we, we, we can really botch this thing because it's so hard. It's like, people are really hard. We're hard. We're hard to get along with. It's hard to be vulnerable. It's hard to believe that I need you. Like, I need you. I mean, it, saying that to another human being is one of the hardest things to say in the world. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I've, I haven't said that much. I mean, you know, I've said that to my wife, but I have dear friends, but that's a hard thing to say. It's unbelievably humbling yeah. and vulnerable, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think it, even more so in a culture like ours, I mean, because I think you go to other parts of the world, that's one of the things I loved about going to Africa the first time is, and, and you see this so much also in the Middle East, but men who hold hands when they walk, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And, and I mean, complete, like married to women, men, that is not, a, you know, it's like, but there's just this sense of like, we are interconnected. I love you. And I want to spend time with you. Yeah, and then yeah. we're going to go home to our wives and our kids. And it's like, yeah. it was like, what is this? Yeah. You know, there's, so there's this, foreign. Yeah. yeah, it's literally, but you yeah. know, it, 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 I think for me, I know for me, it's just, it's hard for me to get there. And I think sadly, and, and what I'm trying to say is I think our culture, be it Christendom or just America, we just, we're not. You're exactly right. Nobody is helping us do that. In fact, it's going the other way. You're individual and yeah. you've got all you need and all you need is yourself to 
and fully find out who you're supposed to be. And the most beautiful you can be is to be the different snowflake. And it's like, right, right. it's just why it's so harmful, you know? Well, and I think it's, it's, if you need another reason for it, like I want my girls to see me having friends as yeah. well. It's a little bit, I mean, I'm speaking in generalities here, but like it's, it's, it's more, uh, you know, encouraged maybe and like just uh, socially acceptable for our wives to yeah. have all this social time. Mm -hmm. And it's much more socially acceptable for us to just work, yeah. you know? Yep. And if we got to miss something for work, that's almost encouraged, you know? And I mean, it's not, it's not looked down upon as much as it would be um, for, I think, for my wife, Amy. But I want my daughters to see that I also am hanging with friends. You know, I want, I think it's important. I think it's, again, it's just, it's, it's a little more just, we don't even think about it. It's more socially acceptable for yeah. men in their forties, fifties, sixties to just kind of be lone wolves, you know? Right. It, it, right. Well, I was going to say quickly to your point, John, it's, it's not, I would say it's that. And it also is compounded by my wife is my best friend and she's yeah, all right. That's, those are those and, and that's to me, that's that I'm not blaming it on Christendom, but gosh, is that so prevalent? And you know, you're yeah, one, yeah. God sees you as one, but some of the best therapy I ever got in my life was sitting with one of our therapists. And I said, one of, if you're wondering just sort of how I'm doing mentally, um, <laughs> and him saying like, Dave, this is something that he was like, I have to deal. And he's a, he's a Christian dude, but he said, this is something I have, I see a lot in Christian couples who grew up, especially sort of in like the eighties, nineties, like I did. He's like, you know, th this thing was sort of beat into our brow, which is like, God sees you as one. You come together as one. And as a man, you sort of stand there and you're accountable for the oneness of your, some of that, yes. But it, I think what I had done is I had put all these expectations on Annie that was like, okay, then like, I need you to be every color of friendship to right, me. Right, right, right. And, and it was like, it just wore her out. And there was fewer things that I've done better in my marriage and realizing like, okay, she occupies this very substantial space. But it is that space. And there are so many holes to fill for friendship for me that I have friends, thankfully, to do that. Yeah. But, you know, it, it helped us out so much because it wasn't that sort of like you get married and then shipped off into the wild and you and your wife are all you need. Congratulations. Next couple, ship them off. You know, where right. it's like, no, no, she's going to be this thing for you, but she's going to be that thing for you. That's, you know, yeah. I always tell people um, that's great if your wife is your best friend just make sure she's not your only best friend yeah that's yeah <laughs> you you can't be the husband that you're supposed to be until you do it alongside other or other mm -hmm. friends um, yeah i mean my, well, i think one of my greatest gifts to my wife and vice versa is that we keep close friends because uh we, one just like you said dave you can't rely on that person to fulfill everything and there's yeah. gonna be certain times yeah because again, we're talking about two centers in the covenant of marriage where you're like, you don't get each other or you, you're frustrated or you can't solve her problem. I mean, Lauren and I will get to points where if we like circle in the argument enough times, we're like, I'll tell you what, can you go talk to your friends about this? I'll go talk to mine, which is, by the way, is a really risky thing to do. It's not yeah. necessarily saying, hey, solve this for us. But yeah, I'm just like, I, I'll talk to my friends. I'm like, I cannot figure out why X, you know, and typically they'll like you know, they'll, they'll push on me in a way that I understand better because she was trying, but she wasn't getting through. And, and, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's for your marriage or for your children, I, I love that, John, what you were talking about. You mean, I want my boys to see me in friendship. Um, you want your girls to see you in friendship. I mean, I think mm -hmm. one of the most redempted, one of the most redemptive things we could do is to raise a generation of children who intuit, oh, it's manly to be in close, vulnerable relationship. With yeah. Them. Yeah. That's yeah. what a man does. Yeah. Like men aren't alone. Like that's dangerous when men are alone. Men, yeah. men are in close relationship with other people. That's, that's what it looks like to be strong is to be vulnerable, to be strong. Yeah. We, Cause that's not the impression that they, um, I think have of men, but it, mm. it's the impression and you, everything I'm saying about this could also be said about women, but it mm. happens that our cultural stereotypes or that, you know, oh, men, women are naturally social, you know, they, they draw together and men, you know, are individuals were you know, rugged individuals. And, and that's just very anti-biblical. Mm -hmm. and, and boy, does it get us in trouble. 
Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, too, the thing, I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's sitcom fodder, but it's true. It's like, I mean, the, this is such low hanging fruit. And, and I mean, everybody listening should and probably will shake their head. But you think about the way that men struggle with lust, particularly, right? Mm-hmm. Me going to my wife and going, babe, I was in Starbucks and this woman came in in this outfit and it just, I didn't want to think about it, but I looked her, it, like, she's going to be, I mean, thank God my wife is a loving and would actually sort of be like, oh, it must've been hard. I'm sorry. And, but you know, like that's not a great conversation to keep having with your okay. wife. It's an amazing conversation to have with your guy friend because yeah. he immediately goes, oh, I know that feeling, bro. I love you. There's grace for that. Mm-hmm. Is there anything I can do to help with that? Like it's, there's no shock value. It's yeah. like, yeah, yeah, I know that. And hey, so yeah. we're. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Dave. If you can keep going, no, no. That, I mean, it's you know, yeah. I, th- I think that just sh- just that one little thing, just and, and I think Annie and I, found, you know, like we've learned these things where it's like, because it's you said it so well, like we'll, we'll loop, we'll, like we're like twenty minutes into the same thing <laughs> in every language you can say it in, yeah. and I think those are usually the tells for us that like this is probably because I just don't understand what that is, nor yeah. you for me. Yeah. And where this would take two minutes with a guy friend right. or a girlfriend. Right. Right. I, so I, I want to make a, a point here that I think might be helpful for people because it's helpful for me. One of the impetuses of this book was that the culture out there, quote unquote, where Surgeon General is writing a report that, you know, that loneliness is killing us younger, like this physiological, this yeah. bodily. Yeah. Yeah. That we're falling yeah. apart. Yeah. Because we're not living in a relationship. And that's when everybody starts to pay attention. Right. Like, Oh my gosh, science says we need other people. And I think for for Christians, it's I think it's so healthy, like and I think this is happening more and more where you we start to get a deeper understanding of like a lot of people growing up, I think, and this was actually mostly from uh outside of the church, were trying to communicate to me that science and faith were opposed in, in mm. some way. Mm. Um and the more I grow my faith and my knowledge of the world, the more I'm like, oh my gosh, stop, like Science it helps me understand so much of how God made us because all truth is, is God's truth. And one of the things that is un, un, unpopular to dig into right now, but so important is, is like the biology of how we are different and why, mm-hmm. like, why would male friendship be important in a unique way? Why would female friendship be important in a unique way? Why is marriage important in a unique way? And I mean, some of it is common sense, but it's also helpful. Like what you just said, Dave, is like there's certain biological struggles that men are predisposed to. Hmm. That we get, you know, oh. and it's like kind of common sense. It's like, oh, you know, talking to a guy about that, it's going to be better. There's certain biological struggles that women have. Let's hmm. say like the whole pregnancy thing hmm. or, or the menstrual cycle thing or the mental health difficulties that come with that. Hmm. Where my wife is trying to explain to me like why she feels this way now. And I'm like, well, you weren't that way yesterday. She talks <laughs> to a girl and it's immediately just hmm. do it in and the sympathy. And it's like, hmm. yeah, I want to work to get there. But hmm. there's uh there is a gift of community that God has given us mm. in biology and this art similarity and differences. It's what makes marriage so great. Mm. It's also what makes same sex friendship so special mm. and all of this stuff, whether it's the beginning of the conversation about why we need it. Yes. Because statistically you'll die younger if you don't have friends, mm. but Genesis also told you that, right? That mm. you were meant for other people. You were made for it. Mm. And all this stuff to me, it just helps me, um, Honestly, I think worship God better because I'm mm. like, oh, what a beautiful divine plan. Mm. And it helps my sanctification because I'm more willing to listen. Because I'm like, yeah, this makes sense on so many levels. Like my mm. body and my soul are more more full when I'm yeah. like my friendship. Yeah. yeah. The um so we're gonna jump to lightning round here in a second. I want to say one more thing. And this is this for everybody that's listening, this is y'all have heard me say this quote, but it is the most um, it's one of the most helpful quotes I've had about friendship and in French, like, cause some people, especially guys, maybe listen to me like, dude, this just sounds like a, mm-hmm. this sounds like a lot. The, um, and John, for you saying this for the thousandth time on this podcast, but I heard somebody say once, whenever we come together, sharing our strengths, it breeds competition. Whenever we come together, sharing our weaknesses, it breeds community. Hmm. And I think for me, this is the hack I'm sharing with everybody. And this is where I'm going with this. For those who think this stuff can be hard, something that is so helpful for me with other guys when I'm trying to build friendships and I'm sitting there and it's just not happening. And it's like you're five bites into your lunch and tell me about you. And it's just like flex, 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 flex. And I'm doing the flex. I have learned that if I will stop my and go, man, can I tell you something that's been kind of tough? Yeah. Like, yeah. And I go, my kid, I just, I don't feel like I'm doing a good job with this. My wife, my, all of a sudden, and I'm not saying hundred percent of the time, because some people may not respond to that or feel threatened, but most of the time 
they go, dude, you know what's crazy? And all of a sudden, connection. You're like, bam, mm-hmm. here we are. Mm-hmm. And so it's become this thing. I still struggle with, especially with new friendships. I'm like, I just, and I'll find, I did this yesterday. I did this yesterday. I was at my son's soccer practice and a girl was talking about uh, her kids and s- smart. And I, I, me, I rose to the occasion. I was like, well, you know, we've, you know, doing good and testing. And I, what am I doing? I'm doing the thing. Like she flexes, I flex. And she's not even flexing. It's just, I was like, I, and I'm like, no, change. And so then it was like, but you know what we're really having a hard time with? And then the conversation followed. Oh and God. so it's funny because I think there is something to us about and it helps me so much as I build friendships to realize when I'm doing that thing to go, this is not actually building something. Whereas if I go, can I tell you what is hard or has been tricky? I'm really struggling through. All of a sudden you get this unbelievable connection that you can so build true. on. You know, it's such that, a help. That kind of, that confidence builds walls, but vulnerability builds relationships. Yeah, that's it. Mm-hmm. That's it. The whole first chapter um, – and honestly, kind of my favorite chapter in a lot of ways of the Made for People book is on vulnerability, about just the deep confession and uh, sort of radical need that we have for each other. But we can, we can talk about that all day. But um. <laughs> it's so good. I, I, I'm just thankful to you. I mean, I think all these books are incredible, and I love what you're doing. It's so helpful, and which leads us right into the lightning round. Lightning round, let's go. So this Here is where you need to buckle up. I'll go number one. If you had to pick one to be for the rest of your life, would it be author or lawyer? Author. But I love being a lawyer. I'm, yeah, I just, I'll, <laughs> when I'm 80, I'll still be an author, but I'll probably have retired from lawyering. Yeah, I love how lightning fast you answer that. <laughs> okay, we're speaking of habits. So what is your quirkiest habit? Right now, I've gotten into the cold shower thing, and uh, oh yes, it's, you know, I'm almost embarrassed to admit it. <laughs> yeah, it is so much it's, worse than a cold plunge. It's terrible. It's, it's so terrible. much worse because a cold plunge, you're um, you're immersed. Your whole, you're just, and then you can get about 30 seconds. And I've done, only done a few times, but it's every, my buddy who does, all, he said, if you can get to 31 seconds, you really your your system calms down. Yeah, you can't job. do that in the shower. You know, you're dying. <laughs> but the shower, you move to the left, and it's like whole new part of my body. It's right. awful. Yeah, but it, it somehow I love it. I don't know. But yeah, that's my quirky. Do you do it every day? Uh, unless I'm sick. Uh, so like when I have a sore throat, I'm like, I'm not sure this is helping. But yes. Yeah, 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 well, yeah. Well, you know, sorry, John. Now, every weekday. On Saturday, okay. a lot of my habits I break on Saturday and Sunday. Scalding hot on Saturday morning. <laughs> yeah, I just, <laughs> I'm, you know, eating potato chips in a warm bath on Saturday morning. <laughs> that well, sounds well, like social media. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that sounds like Sabbath. Um, okay, what habit just, and maybe there hadn't been one, but what habit has completely crashed and burned? Like it just didn't go like you wanted it to. Oh my gosh, most of them. Um, <laughs> I, there's so many things I've tried with my kids. Hey, we're going to do this now, or like we're going to read and, an, like, we're going to start reading the, a book once a week or doing like a, a lot of devotional habits have crashed and burned. <laughs> like we have, a, yeah. we have a great rhythm. We, yeah. We call something rather than nothing which is on like usually Wednesday night after dinner, we'll just stay at the table and like do a little something rather than nothing. But like the big objectives of like, let's do this every week or that and starts to get complicated. It's like, no, like, yeah, we don't have a Sunday school program. We just have like a tangible faith that we live out, you know, something more than nothing. Well, you know, I'll I'll just say quickly, I think for those who want to see it, you have a lot of this on your Instagram feed, but something that I love so much and John and I agree with, about having you on is that it feels like all the things you um, suggest are extremely doable. Like you're not the guy who's like yeah. six hours in the cold plunge. And then what I need you to do is get out and nine hours of prayer and then an hour and a half of sleep. And then we're back, you know, everything that you do, I appreciate. Cause it's like that. It feels like we're just, it's just tiny steps, yeah. you know? Yeah. I'm, I'm not good at this stuff. That's why I need it so badly. So yeah. Has to be <laughs> yeah, agreed. All right. Last question. <clears throat> if you wrote a book on being a dad, what would the title be? How to stop yelling constantly. <laughs> <laughs> and other tips for parenting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. I could probably think of a more serious one, but you know, by fighting back against my struggle to just blow up, blow anger, which I think is like so much of the male struggle. Oh, um, gosh. It's like learning to use, it's kind of back to the biology thing, learning to choose suffering when you have a body and a cultural position that can force anything that you want. You can leave, Mm. you can overpower, uh, you can hit, you can yell. And yet Jesus, you know, has the open palms of suffering that says, Mm. instead of controlling, I will actually suffer on your behalf. I think men's fundamental 
struggle is to say, will I suffer for others when I have the option always to run away and leave? Jeez, yeah, yeah. please. Uh, Look at you dropping just the hammer at the I, end. That was, that God, that was, was like, lightning round, though, was it? I, that took way too long. That was like, no, no, that was Thor's. You just dropped the Thor hammer at the end of this thing. Um, thank you again. And for everybody who's listening, yes. I, I can't encourage you enough to to follow him, read these books. They're just really, really helpful. And and so I'm really glad and we're thankful for you and the time you put into that. Anything you want to uh, press or press? <laughs> <laughs> anything anything push, press, you got coming to the podcast, it's, it's no, habit. That's what all are great. Thank you for the kindness and the laughs. Um, I always, whenever I talk about this, I like to end it by reminding people that habits don't change God's love for you. God's mm. love for you should change your habits. But yeah, that's remember that order. That's great. Well, thank you so yeah, much for being thank you, with thank us. You. We appreciate this. This was great. Y'all, y'all, you bet. Thank you so much. Dad, 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 D